Um, so let's uh, pick up where we left off last time. So last time um, we considered the EFT of uh, electrodynamics of macroscopic objects, um, which were bound in orbit as a warm-up exercise for what we're going to do today. Um, so in particular, we're going to look at binary in spirals. Um, that are uh, um, the targets of LIGO and other gravitational wave observatories. And um, we're going to do so in an analytic uh, fashion um, by um, using uh, the post-Newtonian expansion. Which is uh, V uh, an expansion in V. And um, from a field theoretic point of view, we will also take um, this limit as well, which is obviously an excellent limit for any macroscopic object. And that will differentiate the quantum effects from the classical effects because we're going to utilize our field theoretic knowledge uh, and uh, methodology that we all have come to. Uh, know and love in the HEP community uh, to solve this problem. Now, one question that you might ask immediately is, um, why bother? So in particular, um, when uh, we have a binary in spiral uh, at the early stages of the in spiral when it's moving slowly, um, they're, they're relatively far apart. Uh, and as the system radiates and loses energy, it starts to spiral in. And then um, the V expansion breaks down. And so um, one has to use numeric, what's uh, often termed NR for numerical relativity. And so um, you're saying, well, if you're doing using numerical relativity, why uh, bother doing anything analytic um, as an expansion? And the answer is, of course, well, the answer is twofold. The first is, of course, it's always preferable to do things analytically because we can, we have more control. We can see what's going on. We can extract more information. Uh, but also um, because during the early stages of the in spiral, um, you start to uh, accrue errors over many, many orbits. So numerically, it's very expensive to do many orbits and keep the errors down. So uh, towards the end, where you have the last few orbits, um, then um, numerical relativity takes over. So it's a complementary calculation to the numerical relativity calculation. Um, and I should just, just, just a second here to discuss the experiment is the way they look for signals is they build what's known as template banks, right? So you consider um, a set of, mo of, of possible signals, say, where um, this, th this direction is, is the mass of the first one uh, or, the, or some combination of the masses, some parameters, and this one, say, is the spin. Uh, and of course, there's more dimensions in this because you can have different spins along different axes and uh, so forth and so on. Um, and so this is some parameter bank, right? So you, you, you have to have signals for every possible um, uh, set of permutations of parameters, different spins and different masses. And then you, the way you search for signals is you do something called match filtering, which is basically you take the overlap of the data with the, with, um, the um, possible model or the possible signal that you would get theoretically, and you try to maximize basically, very roughly speaking, the overlap between the two. But that means you need to have a very large template of, of, um, of possible signals based on your theory. And it's computationally numerical relativity um, would, would be out of the question. So um, 
the, the group, the LIGO theory group has their own sort of meat grinding machinery where they stick in all the theory and as best as they can in a, in a systematic a way as they possibly can to try to generate signals for each one of these um, uh, parameter values in the space of possible signals. So there's a demand for analytic calculations uh, is twofold, um, not only because um, uh, it's a, it, it, each individual one is expensive if you're interested in the early stages of the in-spiral, extracting information from the early stages because you have to do so many orbits, but also because you have to build these large template banks. Um, now, I should say that once they do get a signal and they really want to extract the parameters as best as they can, then they run the numerical code for the particular values of the parameters that they're close they're they're near this you know some subset of of this space um, in order to maximize your the accuracy of uh, extraction of all the parameters of the of the particular signal that you're looking at okay so enough with um sort of motivation so um we want to set up an eft based upon a double expansion um, in these uh, in these parameters, and um, so we want to be able to relate all the uh, all the parameters of the uh, the particular um, observable we're looking at in terms of these two expansion parameters. So, in particular. Um, we want to be able to determine how G M squared scales as V and how does it scale in L. And remember G is one over 32 pi M Planck squared. So as a particle physicist, I'm often going to use M Planck. Um, in, in the relativity community, you would never see that because you need an H bar uh, and a relativist would never um, want to involve H bar uh, when doing classical GR at least. But, um, but, but I'm gonna use the M Planck and I'm gonna trade it uh, for one, for one of G is one over M Planck squared uh, um, liberally during my talk. Okay, so, um, so let's do some power counting. So um, we know that if we have a bound orbit, then um, the virial expansion, the virial theorem tells us that the potential energy should be of order of the kinetic energy. And here I'm taking the masses to scale roughly in the same way. So we could see therefore that uh, GM over R scales as V squared. And we know that L scales is R M V, right? So uh, therefore um, we could trade R for L over M V. So we could see that um, G M squared um, sorry. So this thing scales as V squared. So G M squared V over L scales as V squared. So G M squared must scale as um, LV. Yeah, we're going to use that. So, or we could say that M over and Planck scales is the square root of the LV. Okay, so this is always the first exercise one goes through when um, building an effective field theory. You have to know how everything counts, power counts in terms of your expansion parameters, okay? Now, um, uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, we know that as V goes to zero, we expect uh, the curvature 
um, uh, to go to zero, or in other words, we should be close to, uh, close to flat space. Um, this will allow us to expand around flat space because an expansion V is an expansion around flat space. So we can see that because we know that the Riemann tensor and in the, in the Newtonian limit, Okay, so this scales as D, uh, sorry. GM over R cubed, okay. So in units of the Planck length, so if we look at R mu nu rho sigma, <coughs> um, uh, over M Planck squared, so this is something dimensionless. So in units of the Planck length, we have something, this goes like something like G squared M over R cubed, right? So um, now we've already figured, uh, let's see, so R, we already have our scaling for R. So this goes like uh, G squared M over, uh, L cubed M V cubed, right? Um, so this goes like uh, G squared um, M squared. Uh, wait, uh, I think I've got the unit. Something's wrong here. Hold on. Four, three. That's right. Um, Sorry, let me. So let me write this as, uh, sorry, yeah, this is simpler. GM over R squared, one over MR. And this goes like uh, V to the fifth over L. So let me write, gonna write this as RMV and put a V here. And we already said that GMR, we already determined the scaling of GM over R through the virial theorem. So we could see that clearly that as V goes to zero, this thing is gonna vanish. So which we've just shown is, is that, uh, is that uh, V goes to zero is flat space. Okay, and that makes things tractable because we can use flat space propagators. If we were using, um, if we were expanding around a curved space, we would have to use the curved space propagators and typically there's no closed form, uh, 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 closed form solution for those propagators. Um, so it would be uh, out of control uh, or out of our ability to calculate systematically. Okay. So now we, we have our power counting and we can set up our effective theory. So we're gonna do, we're going to mirror our warm up exercise um, uh, as we did before in three and two stages or so two point particles and then eventually one point particle. So uh, the first stage of the matching or the first part of the effective theory, we'll call this one and we'll call this two, is to go to the point particle limit. So we know how to do that. Okay, we're now, this is the full curved space metric. Okay, uh, plus uh, finite size terms, plus the bulk. Einstein action, okay. Um, so let's discuss the finite size effects. So if you remember for QED, we had uh, E squared, 
and B squared as our leading operators. So it started off quadratic in the field. And we might say, well, okay, this is a uh, slightly different uh, in gravity now because we have to write down, so remember all diff invariant. So there are symmetries. which we must impose are um, diff invariants or general coordinate invariants, diffeomorphism invariants. And again, reparameterization invariants. Okay. So, well, what can we write down that's diff invariant? Well, the first thing we might want to write down is R d lambda. I'm not going to worry about RPI. So RPI can always be fixed by putting in the right powers of V squared. Okay, so I'm not going to worry about that. It's a, um, a simple, uh, simple clue for any term. You just put in the right power and then make it invariant just from um, simple considerations of the chain rule. Okay, so the first term we might ask, we might add this, which is linear, and we might add this. Okay. Uh, but um, we can set these to zero because they are proportional to the equations of motion. So this is a general statement about EFTs, which we didn't touch upon last time, is we're allowed to use the equations of motion at the level of the action. And the reason is, is because you can, any term proportional to the equation of motion can always be removed by a field redefinition. So let me show you why that's true in a, um, in a, in a simple case and which generalizes. Okay, so suppose we're, let's just look at a simple, I'll, I'll show you for a scalar theory, but the generalization to other representations of the Lorentz group are, is um, straightforward. Uh, so suppose we have the theory of a massless scalar. Um, and then we have some operator in our action, which is proportional to the leading order equations of motion. Now, uh, this is gonna be some higher dimensional operator. So I'm gonna put in some scale here to some power where this N is determined by the dimensionality of the function F. And C is some, number, which is unknown. You can just absorb it into F if you wish. Okay, and now we're gonna make a field redefinition. Phi goes to phi minus um, F of C over two F D phi to the lambda to the N. So now delta L is going to be, um, uh, minus C over two F over lambda to the N <clears throat> box phi plus or minus C over two phi box F after integrating by parts. So this delta L will exactly cancel, uh, will exactly cancel this term. Okay. Plus, of course, plus order one over lambda to the two n. Okay. So it's not completely true that these operators have zero effect, um, but all they do is generate higher dimensional operators in the theory which when we power count them will be suppressed. So if we wanted to uh, go to higher orders, we'd have to include them, but to, to, uh, to leading order, you would just be able to ignore them. So the same thing goes for um, these terms. Um, <clears throat> and you can, uh, as an exercise, figure out what shift in the metric would do this, would eliminate these terms. Um, so it's kind of interesting because what this is telling you uh, is that there are no there are no terms in the action linear 
in the metric. Side from <clears throat> okay. Now, of course, it doesn't really look linear in the metric here. It would only look, there'll be a linear piece. There'll be a linear piece once we expand around flat space. And so this is completely consistent with Birkhoff's theorem. which says that the unique solution to Einstein's uh, field equations is uh, for non-spinning space-time um, is for non-spinning object is uh, just a Schwarzschild solution and it has one free parameter and that is M. And that's basically what we've determined. If we had other terms, <clears throat> if these terms did contribute then there be this would contribute to the one point function or the expectation value of h and this would now depend on c which would violate Birkhoff's theorem. okay um so uh the first um what are the first finite size effects that we can write down <clears throat> Well, we know it's going to have to be quadratic in um, in the Riemann tensor, um, and it's convenient, in fact, to eliminate all pieces of the Riemann tensor which vanish on shell. So the way we do that is we introduce the Weyl tensor. So the Weyl tensor is defined in this way. Okay, so um, basically notice that these terms vanish on shell. So what we've done is we've taken the Riemann tensor and we subtracted out all the pieces that vanish on shell. So it's basically, it, we're trying to get rid of all the on shell information, stuff that vanishes on shell from Riemann. And that's what we've done. And that simplifies your life because you're not carrying around unnecessary baggage. Now we could further decompose um, C into what's known as the electric and magnetic parts of the vial tensor. In terms of our four velocity, in general, it can be any um, time-like vector. where this is the, the Hodge dual. So there's an epsilon tensor there. Um, and on shell, this is the same thing as the, as um, because basically these terms on shell are just zero, okay? Um, physically, um, what E is, is basically the, um, if you have two particles and their, uh, their relative tidal acceleration, so the, sorry. Uh, the the rate the the tidal acceleration is a measure of so if I've got two guys in a tidal field they're going to approach each other so if there's a, a body here that's attracting them then the the electric part of the vial tensor basically tells you how this acceleration is changing so that they're approaching each other 
And the magnetic one is basically the boosted version of that, just like the electric field is the boosted version of the magnetic field. So these are really uh, very analogous to the electric and magnetic parts of the, of the electric field. The distinction, of course, being this, this is parity odd, and this is parity even. And now we can write down some terms in our action in analogy with our warm-up exercise. Okay, and this term you could write down, but it breaks parity. So we're gonna assume the parity is a good symmetry. If you had some compact object which maximally violated parity, then, um, then you would have to include this, this term, okay? So for us, we're just gonna assume for the moment that we're looking say at a black hole or a neutron star that doesn't violate parity, okay? Okay, so the next step is, uh, so now we've got a theory of two point particles. Well, you could have more, of course, but. <clears throat> That's our action at this stage. There are other terms here. There are nonlinear terms in B, there, uh, E and B. I mean, they're higher order polynomials. Um, and you could also have derivatives. So um, these again, correspond to responses of the system. CE and CB are what's known as the um, tidal love numbers. And in, with, in an exact analogy to uh, the electromagnetic case, um, um, these correspond to the tidal susceptibility. So if you put an object in a quadrupole field, then it will distort by some amount and form a quadrupole moment. And the size of the quadrupole moment will be proportional to CE, if you put it in an electric quadrupole as opposed to a magnetic quadrupole. Now, something remarkable uh, happens to be true. So if you do the matching, you do it exactly the same way we discussed in the electromagnetic case. You put it in a background field, you solve Einstein's equations to see the linear response, then it turns out that CE equals CB equals zero for a black hole. Okay, so that's a remarkable prediction of GR. Um, and it basically says that if you put a black hole in a background quadrupole field and look at infinity, there's no quadrupole response. In fact, the statement is much stronger than this. It's all multiple moments. So if you put a black hole in a, any arbitrary static multiple field of any multiple, the black hole does not respond at all, which is counterintuitive. Um, it is and it is not in the sense that um, if you think of the black hole as a fun, as an elementary particle, an elementary particle would also not respond, right? It has no internal structure. So there is this um, remarkable um, uh, similarity between black holes and as if they were just fundamental particles. It's also, uh, for instance, the no hair theorem, which states that all black holes are identical, just like fundamental particles are identical. So in that way, it's sort of consistent. 
But physically, if we think of the black hole as a lump of energy, then certainly you would expect it to respond. Um, it, it's all due to the existence of the horizon, um, not surprisingly, that this property holds. So you would think, so as particle physicists, if, a, um, if we see a vanishing coefficient of an operator in action, we automatically assume that um, there must be a symmetry responsible for this. And recently there was a paper, um, 2105 uh, by uh, this group. And they claim to have found a symmetry which explains it. Now the remarkable, another remarkable fact I should say is that this, this statement only holds true in four dimensions. So all that argument about it's an elementary particle, well, if it's an elementary particle in four dimensions, why is it an elementary particle in five dimensions? So it's kind of a bogus argument in some ways. Um, so there seems to be something very special about black holes in four dimensions. Um, as a side note, another unique thing about four dimensions and black holes is that you can't have black holes with any, with whose horizon topology is anything but a S2, a sphere. So you could ask, why aren't there black rings in, um, in, in four space-time dimensions, right? Or black, any other topology, a black a double torus or something like that, right? With horizons that have those shapes. There's a, actually a, a reason for that, but it is, it's unique. It, it's because, actually, because, um, because a horizon is a two-dimensional object um, and it has to have positive curvature. So we know from two-dimensional geometry that the only object with positive curvature in two dimensions is uh, S2. Okay. Um, so there's something special about four dimensions, not completely understood uh, at this point. Um, and this is a nice, uh, I haven't gone through it, I, um, so I can't tell you the details of it, but they claim to have found a symmetry which explains it. Okay, okay, now back to Earth. <coughs> so our next step is to uh, integrate out the potential modes, just as we did before. So we expand around flat space. Uh, and we write in terms of the potential field and the radiation field. Okay, now we're gonna, so just as in the previous case, uh, K potential, and K radiation will have momentum which scale in this way. <coughs> so um, let's uh, integrate out to this mode. So we're gonna expand the action by substituting this. Um, and then we will uh, integrate out by calculating the vacuum diagrams um, uh, connected by potential modes, okay? So um, in order to do that in a systematic way, we have to determine how things scale in V. So in particular, how does H scale with V? Well, we could figure that out by, uh, there are lots of ways of doing it, but let's look at its two-point function. Okay, uh, so my, my uh, 
my brain is wired such that this is true by definition. So I'm um, That's my, you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll be writing these brackets a lot. So um, it just happens naturally. So, um, <clears throat> so let's figure out how this thing scales. Well, for, we know that for potential mode, we drop the energy. So that, that um, uh, becomes a spatial gradient. Uh, so we have to figure out how the, um, how the measure scales. Now, uh, the energy scales is V over R, right? Because this is basically the frequency. And dimensionally, K has to scale like one over R, okay? So, um, so we have uh, H of X, H of zero scales as, um, the measure scales as V over R squared. And then we have uh, one over K squared, which scales like R squared. <coughs> um, sorry, I've got not enough powers here. Okay, therefore H scales as one half over R. Okay, and we'll, we'll use that now to determine uh, how every term in the action scales. So in general, whenever you write down an effective theory, you wanna make sure that every term in the action scales homogeneously in your expansion parameter, and you have to know how each term in the action, uh, how each term in the action scales so that you can power count properly whatever you want to ca uh, calculate. So um, now let's expand the action. So we're going to expand. Um, and I'm going to ignore the radiation piece for the moment. So the leading order term is when I take these guys. So I'm going to take uh, lambda to be t. I'm going to choose my affine parameter to be t so that now x zero dot just becomes one. So the leading order term is going to be when I pick up the zero zero component of this guy. So the leading order term is going to be s, well, let's call it s zero, is going to be minus m over two m Planck. The one half comes from expanding the, the square root. Then we have H zero zero DT. Okay, so that's S zero. And let's figure out how this thing scales. Well, T scales as one over energy. So this is gonna scale as R over V, one over the frequency. This guy we just determined scales as V to the one half over R. And this is our friend that we determined way back here. Let's carry this around. So we're going to use it a lot. Okay, so this entire S zero is gonna scale like um, square root of L um, and that's it. Square root of L and no powers of V. So this is the leading order term in the action. Now let's calculate the, the term which is explicitly linear in V. So let's call it S sub V. Uh, so now we have to expand and keep the H zero I component. And this guy scales as V times the square root of L. 
And uh, for laughs, let's go to the next order. For reasons you'll see, we, to get something non-trivial, we have to. <clears throat> Okay, so notice uh, there's explicit v-squares here, but here there is not. And that's because uh, it's order v-squared because I go to second order in the field, um, which uh, um, will lead to v-squared scaling because we know that h0 scales as uh, one half, v the one half. Okay, so you can, I'm gonna leave this as an exercise, but you can show that each one of these terms does indeed scale as v squared times the square root of L. Okay. So now let's calculate the vacuum energy uh, to order v squared. And I should tell you some terminology. So v to the any term v to the two n is called the um, uh, uh, n p n approximation. Okay, so it always, it's, uh, there's always a factor two. The reason is, is because for any conservative force, it will always be even in V by time reversal invariant. So uh, as long as you're looking at all the conservative forces, it'll always be some even power of V. So two N, two little N is the little N P N uh, uh, expansion. Okay. Um, good. So let's let's uh, let's do the leading order case, and we can read off the potential by calculating this diagram, and equating it in the following way. So this diagram, you get an i squared one from each vertex, then I bring down two powers of the leading order insertion. So then we have H00 of X1 and T H00 X2 of T. And then we have M1, M2 over two M times squared. So these, this just comes from the Feynman rule from, from this operator. Now we need to know what is, what is uh, the propagator. And so we have to choose a gauge. So um, now we like to choose a gauge that preserves manifest gauge invariance for the um, radiation mode. In so doing, once we integrate out the, um, the potential mode, then we will have an action which is manifestly different variance. So we can use different variance to simplify our all calculations because we know the final answer has to be different variant. So if you have some, some piece which looks like the curvature, which has the nonlinear terms, you only need one piece to fix the coefficient and then the rest, you know, will automatically fall out from different variants. So there's a huge advantage to using the background field gauge, just like we do in QCD. So um, a common useful gauge to choose is the harmonic gauge. So the harmonic gauge we add to the action, the gauge fixing term looks something like this. <clears throat> So this is the connection where um, the covariant connection are written in terms of, this will be a function of H radiation, 
right? So you basically take the next and you lift it to a covariant derivative where now this has a function of the radiation background field. So the, you think of the radiation as a long wavelength mode, which is thought of as a static background compared to the fast moving um, modes of the potential. Just like in, in QCD. So the propagator in this, um, in this gauge for the potential mode looks like this. Where, where this base, this guy is uh, a tensor formed out of products of, uh, of um, flat space metrics. Okay, I'm sorry, and I'm missing an E to the I. Okay. So now we have uh, minus I This turns out to be a half. And then we have integral dt dt prime e to the minus i k zero t minus t prime. Okay, and now because we've expanded and there's no K zero here, we could do the K zero integral. And this just gives a delta function and makes it instantaneous in time. Okay, uh, and then this integral we can do, and this just gives one over four pi R. So the net result is V is equal to minus M1, M2, 32 pi M Planck squared R. Okay, so that's just a sanity test to make sure we have um, uh, uh, everything in order with all our factors. Have to make the signs are always, of course, a pain. Um, so let's. We also know that this thing scales as um, square root of l, and the way we know that we could go through it just the l counting, but the way we know that is because we know that the leading order um, vertices here scaled to the square root of l. And so by power counting, if I insert two of those vertices, my result, sorry. Um, has to scale like L. Okay. So actually I should put in the DT here. So that means uh, that clearly we don't want anything suppressed by L. So we only want uh, to include diagrams which scale as L exactly. And if they scale um, as um, fewer powers of L, then that means they're quantum corrections and we can ignore them. So the L power counting will allow us to distinguish between classical and quantum corrections. Okay, so now let's calculate the subleading pieces. Well, there are multiple sources. We could have a, an S1 and an S0. Oh, sorry. In principle, we could have S1, S0. This we know is going to have to be zero because this would be odd in V and would violate time reversal. 
It's also algebraically zero if you were to calculate it. Uh, so then the first contribution will be S1, S1, S2, S0. And finally, we could also have S0, S0, S2, the S2 piece, which is quadratic. This is the S2 piece, which goes as V squared explicitly. This guy has V to the zero, but has two powers of H. Okay. And, you know, plus symmetric diagrams where we flip one and two. But in addition, we have another contribution, um, namely this one. So this is a bulk interaction, a bulk nonlinearity. And let's see how we need to know how this guy scales. So if we put in S0 here, S0 here, and S0 here, then the question is, how does this guy scale? Well, as a little exercise, this is good practice here. Let's look at the, what the action looks like. Okay, so and here what I mean generically is two derivatives acting on the fields and remember that the d zero scales as V because this brings down an energy, which we know is suppressed. So here we're only interested in spatial derivatives at leading order. Okay, so this thing. So how does the we have to figure out how the measure scales. Well, D3X scales as R cubed, uh, DT scales like R over V as the inverse energy. This guy scales as one over R squared. <clears throat> and um, then we have uh, H cubed scales as V to the one half over R cubed. And then let me uh, then I have M Planck squared over M Planck cubed. Okay. So uh, then we have so overall we have R to the fourth over V, one over R squared, V to the three halves. R cubed, M over M Planck. Okay, um, good. So we have a one over R. Then we have a V to the one half. And then we have our M over M Planck, which we say goes like the square root of V uh, L. Sorry, uh, do I have my V's right? Um, Sorry, yeah, V the one half, V the one half, V. Uh, hold on, I'm missing a factor. <clears throat> oh, no, that's right. Okay. Um, and I cheated here. I skipped a step, so let me go back. Uh, so this is one over R V to the one half. And let me put in an M and then an M Planck here. Then I got to put an M downstairs and let me put a V here and a V upstairs. So now this goes like um, one over L. So this guy is L. Then we've got a V to the three halves. And now we have square root of V L. So this thing goes like 
V squared over root L. Okay, so it does indeed scale as um, does indeed scale as V squared. And now let's check the L counting. So this goes like root L, root L, root L. This goes like one over root L. So the whole thing goes indeed like L. All right. So now we've just shown that we indeed have to include uh, this uh, bulk three point interaction since it scales as V squared L. And so now our full next to leading order potential is composed of. Okay, where this is um, uh, one, one, two, zero, 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 two, and zero, zero, zero. So this calculation, oh, wait, I'm sorry. There's one other term I forgot. There's also this term, zero, zero, but now we have to expand the propagator to one further order, put in a K zero squared. So this comes from, remember, we take this full theory piece and we expand it. So that corresponds to an insertion of K zero. This is called the einstein infeld hoffman action. So this looks like G squared M1, M2, M1 plus M2 over two R squared. Okay, so this is called the Einstein infield Hoffman action. I think it was actually first calculated by Lorentz, even before Einstein infield and Hoffman. And that's the first uh, uh, correction. Now, first of all, it's important to note that this is gauge dependent. The potential itself is not a physical observable. So it's not surprising that it's gauge dependent. So if you want to calculate, if you do the gauge transformation, any co coordinate transformation will change this guy. If you wanted to calculate something coordinate invariant, you have to calculate something that you measured infinity. So an example would be say the energy infinity as a function of the frequency of the orbit. That would be gauge invariant. So you could calculate, um, um, you can, put it in a circular orbit, solve for the energy in terms of VIH and VEIH, and then change gauges until you get the same answer. Another thing you could calculate would be use this potential to calculate a scattering amplitude, because scattering amplitude S matrix elements are gauge invariant. So that's another a check you can make if you have several um, potentials, uh, uh, several gauge results for, for the same potential to see if your answer is correct. Okay. All right, so now um, let's uh, talk about radiation. So I should say, I, I think I'm gonna run out of time before I get to it. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we'll talk about it in the discussion session if I don't have time to get to it is, this is where the scattering amplitudes come in. So instead of calculating these Feynman diagrams, we know Feynman diagrams are very, um, uh, clunky and carry an unnecessary amount of baggage. So we prefer to use scattering amplitudes as you guys are learning in this, um, in this uh, summer school. Uh, and so you can use scattering amplitudes instead of these Feynman diagrams, but you have to, so what you do is you calculate some two to two scattering and we want to extract the potential. So you have to take the right limits of this scattering amplitude that forces these guys to always be on shell and ignores quantum loops. 
and it, we have to, uh, hopefully in the discussion session we'll have some time to discuss that. Um, but now we at least have the machinery you need to understand uh, how to go about that. But we'll 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 get to that hopefully. The next thing we want to do, of course, is to calculate the radiation. So we want to match our two particles onto a single particle in the exact <coughs> analog of what we did previously. So if you remember what we did before is we took J mu, A mu, and then we multiple expanded A. And this led to an action which looks like Q A zero. Okay, and we're gonna do the exact same thing here. Now we start off with the definition of the stress energy sensor saying to the graviton. And we're gonna expand it. So this isn't really, we're only multiple expanding in space. So there's a T zero here. Okay, and so um, we can sort of see what's happening now if we look at the components. So there's going to be a T zero zero E three X H zero zero, but this is just the total mass of the system. And then there's going to be a term T zero I E three X H zero I, but this is P I. Okay. Um, and then in your, in one of the exercises, you're going to show that the next order term couples the angular momentum to the spin connection. Um, and then if you go to next order and you complete all the terms, you get a coupling that looks like this plus higher order multiples where QIJ is D three X T zero zero X I X J minus one third delta I J. Okay. So basically what we have is S. Let me go to the center of mass frame where the system is at rest. And then we're gonna have M H zero zero. Okay, now um, the radiation, much like <clears throat> Q couples to A zero, there's no radiation due to this term because the charge is conserved. And any when the field couples to a conserved quantity, it can't radiate because you need some time dependence. So these guys won't lead to any real radiation. They play an important role, which I'll discuss in a moment. Uh, but this piece leads to the leading order radiation. So we can calculate the leading order power loss um, if we can figure out what QIJ is. So the leading order power loss is going to come from squaring the one graviton emission, integrating over K, and then weighting it by K. So this is basically the probability to emit a, a graviton, and we want to um, we want to weight it by the energy to get the power per unit time, the energy per unit time. Um, so that's a standard calculation, and this just leads to um, this is a factor of. Newton. Okay. 
And this is the quadrupole mass formula. Um, now we need to know what is, what is Q? Okay, so Q again comes from a matching calculation. So how do we use Feynman diagrams to figure out what Q is? <laughs> So um, we do. We can uh, use a little trick here by noting that if I look at the Fourier transform, Okay, so if I want the nth moment of, um, of T, <coughs> so D3X, X, I, X, J, X, K, whatever, X, N, is going to be D by D, Q, oh, um, I, Okay, so this trick, all we need to do is calculate the Fourier transform of T, differentiate it with respect to the Q, and this will give us all the moments. Okay, so now we can use all our Feynman diagram technology. I have to worry about one of brand factorials, but okay. Um, so we can calculate um, T, you knew Q is just the one point function with momentum Q. Um, and now we're going to get all sorts of contributions. We're going to get contributions where um, it comes off of the first particle, the symmetric one where it comes off the second particle. Um, and then, so this would be at leading order, right? So at leading order, uh, so this is going to be sum over a m a over two m Planck e to the i q dot x a. Okay, and there's the, the time dependence isn't going to play a role here, so we'll include it just for just for uh, giggles. Uh, and then we could expand this guy, and um, we're going to get um, if we look at here. I'm looking at the coupling to t zero zero. So this, if we look at T00, we look at H00, and the coupling we know is just to the mass in this way. So then we end up with uh, D3X T00 Xi Xj is just two derivatives of this guy. And this is gonna give, um, oh, uh, yeah, this is an overall factor of 2M Planck, which I need to include. So um, T is two and Planck um, D by D H of S. So I have to multiply by two and Planck and that, that kills that guy there. Okay, uh, so this shows us what the leading order quadrupole matching now, um, if you go to higher order, then you need to include one point functions where the graviton couples to the potential. And all that does is has the effect of shifting these m's to m plus v, as you would expect. And you can go on and calculate, you know, higher order contributions to multiples. And the form of this will no longer be so simple. You know, you, you have to worry about um, other contributions as well. When you go to higher order, you're gonna do things like that. And it changes the shape, the, the structural form of the multiple moment due to the nonlinearities of gravity. So this has been carried out um, 
within the effective field theory formulation has been carried out to 2 pn. Uh, in standard GR techniques, they've calculated to 3 pn. So there's still a EFT uh, calculation to be done there. Um, and I should say the potential. Uh, we we I showed you how to calculate the v squared has been calculated to uh, to 4 pn. Um, using EFT techniques, actually by three multiple groups, and now uh, I think three or four groups have now done it, um, and they all agree on uh, the potential up to obviously to gauge transformations. Okay, um, so um, what hap Interesting things happen when you go to higher orders, as usual. Um, So in particular, you know, we said that we have our action. But what's the role of these terms here? So this term we've just seen contributes to the power loss through the diagram looks like this, but what about these guys? Now, these guys don't lead to any physical radiation because as I said, they couple to um, conserve quantities, um, but they do have physical effects. And in particular, so here's our, let me draw it as a thick line for our binary and our final EFT, which is one particle. This guy has some total mass and it will generate its own short shield solution. So it has its own potential. Um, and the graviton that you emit from a Q can scatter off the short shield background generated by M. This is called the tail effect. And it's nothing but Coulomb scattering that we get in analogy with quantum mechanics. The interesting thing about it is that it is infrared divergent, not surprisingly, so you have to regulate it. And so if you use dim reg, you get a one over epsilon IR, but it, part, it turns out as you would expect it to be, um, infrared divergence should not be physical. Um, it just goes into, uh, can, it cancels in the power, uh, just like you, when you square with the amplitude, the imaginary the, uh, phase goes away. Now, the interesting question is, well, sure, that's if you calculate the power, but what if I calculate the field? <clears throat> I don't have to calculate the power, right? I could calculate the field, and in principle, I could cal I can measure um, all these gradients of the field. I can measure the phase of the wave. This guy contributes to the phase, so um, how do I understand that? And we understand that because the phase uh, um, all we can really measure is changes in the phase because to know the phase, we'd have to know the complete history of the black hole or whatever it is that's em emitting the, uh, the radiation. And um, so there is no initial time or initial phase which we could possibly measure. So there's some unknown infinite phase shift that comes from the whole history of the whole. All we can measure are the differences and so this unknown, this infrared divergence is really just a signal of that um, ignorance. Now, something really interesting happens if we go to next order. Sorry, I'm blowing it up further now for no particular reason. If we look at two tail insertions, this guy actually has an ultraviolet divergence. An honest to goodness, honest to goodness, ultraviolet divergence. So how do we handle that? Well, we handle that by uh, writing down a, a counter term for Q. So Q gets renormalized. <coughs> and, and so this means there has to be a log, right? So with this, with this epsilon UV, there's a log. So in fact, if you calculate this amplitude, and I normalize it to the tree level result, it looks something like this.
So there's a log here. And notice that you, the K, remember K is of order one over R, which in this theory is like the ultraviolet cutoff. So mu has a natural scale of um, uh, V over R because we're looking at the scale renormalized at the long distance scale. So it'd be like a hadronic matrix element, which we would renormalize at the long distance scale lambda QCD. So this is a log of V. And as V goes to zero, um, that log becomes a dominant term in, in a series. And so we can use the RG to resum these logs. So we can write down an RG equation for Q. And solving this RG equation resums these logs. Now, it's not quite like what we do in QCD. So in QCD, we sum logs, alpha logs. Okay, and um, <coughs> alpha log can become order one. But here, uh, we have to be careful because we're summing V squared log V. So as V goes to zero, this thing still vanishes. So you're not, when you're resumming logs in any non relativistic theory, um, you're not doing something systematic because at higher orders in V, there are terms just as big as the terms that you're, you're keeping. Whereas in QCD, you're keeping all the leading order terms. So the renormalization group is actually uh, systematic. Okay, um, so I've got a few minutes left. So let me start talking about how to use scattering amplitudes to um, to calculate potential. So, um, so what we do is we consider um, two to two scattering of scalars. Um, if we wanted to look at spinning black holes, then we would look at fields in uh, other represent high representations of the Lorentz group. But if we're only worried about, say, particles which aren't spinning, then the scalars are sufficient. And um, we want to look at the, uh, the limit where T is much less than S uh, because we're interested in potentials. So remember, a potential If we want something to be a potential, it has to be instantaneous. And it becomes instantaneous when we drop this K zero squared, okay? So we're gonna take the mass of these guys to be huge compared to T. Where T is this momentum exchange here, which is some space-like momentum exchange. Um, and then we're going to extract the potential by taking that limit and just Fourier transforming with respect to, to let's call this Q squared. Okay. Okay. Um, now <clears throat> we want to. Uh, to extract this potential, we need to match onto some theory. And we're gonna match onto a quantum field theory of, uh, of uh, scalars. So we're gonna match onto L EFT will look something like uh, D3X, D3Y. Okay, and by, let's say by translational invariance. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're going to match and we're going to extract this V. Okay. Now, um, when we calculate this scattering amplitude, there's a huge amount of extra baggage that we don't want. 
Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, so this has quantum stuff in it. And it also includes real radiation. Okay, so in other words, if I look at some complicated uh, topology, there's gonna be some contribution to the scattering amplitude where this graviton goes on shell, and that would correspond to some real radiation, and that's not a local process. That um, leads to a potential. It leads to non-local contributions to potential, and actually those show up, but at uh, not, not until higher order. So um, we're not interested in graviton poles. We're only interested basically in, um, in the matter poles. Okay, because the matter we want to obviously be on shell because these are black holes, they're not fluctuating, um, but we want the gravitons to be off shell. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we have to figure out how to extract. Um, so there are two things we want. We want, um, we want only the classical pieces. And we want only matter poles. Okay, so that's the challenge to the scattering amplitude um, uh, uh, um, methodology: is how do we take some complicated diagram and um, extract only the classical pieces and only the um, the matter poles. So uh, the way to um, to go about this, let's first do um, a little bit of power counting. So so let's call this Q the momentum exchange. So J. The angular momentum, which we're going to take to be classical, goes like uh, k times the impact parameter, and the impact parameter is one over q. So we're going to take j to be much, much larger than one in units of the Planck mass. Okay, so um, What we want to do is figure out which di how diagrams scale in J or, or how and keep only this diagram which scales as J cubed. Okay, so any diagram which scales as fewer powers of J is quantum. And uh, interestingly enough, some diagrams scale as um, more powers of J. Um, so how, how can that be? Well, let's, uh, let's figure out how to figure out um, how topologies scale. So let's look at just one loop topologies. So we can imagine uh, if we reduce To, to our um, uh, set of, of uh, scalar integrals. We could have triangle integrals, box integrals, and bubbles at one loop. <clears throat> and we want to figure out how these guys scale. So the first thing we're going to, we're going to notice is uh, what regions of momentum space contribute. So the, we're going to call, we're going to split it up into hard regions and soft. The hard region is when the typical loop moment is of order of the mass. And it's relatively easy to see that those will all be suppressed. Um, and the reason is, is because in the hard region, let's, let's for instance, consider the triangle.
okay? So we can look at uh, the co relative contributions of all the regions. So in the hard region, K is much larger than Q. <clears throat> and uh, will be suppressed. But first, let's look at how, it's, how, uh, how it scales in the soft region. So let's look at the soft region. So in the soft region, I can't drop Q with respect to K, I have to keep them. But P is much, much larger. P and M are much larger than K and Q. So this term, I'm only gonna keep the uh, P dot uh, K plus Q. Okay, and P, P will take to be of order M. So this thing goes like one over MQ, okay? However, if we looked in the hard region, we can see, so remember Q, um, Q is of uh, scales as um, one over J. If we look at the hard region, then we can drop the Qs. And since K is of order Q, I can, uh, K is of order P, I can drop it. And this thing has no powers of one over Q. So it's gonna be down by uh, powers of J relative to this guy. Of course, this is a scaleless integral, so you have to define it in some way. Um, but what the important point is, is that there's no, there's no non-analyticity in Q in the sense that nothing depends on Q. So um, it won't have any inverse powers of one over Q and therefore will be suppressed, okay? So the hard region will be suppressed and all we're gonna be considered with that means we could take all our integrands, all our scalar integrals um, and expand it uh, and just look at it in the, in the soft region. Sorry, and I guess I need a plus, I shouldn't have dropped the K squared here because uh, it's of order P dot K. Um, so I guess what I said before about it being scaleless is not true. I should be more careful. since it gets, uh, um, and it does depend on that P. But nonetheless, it's independent of Q and is, uh, is therefore has to be suppressed, okay? <clears throat> um, now, what's interesting is that if we calculated this diagram and we did the exact same analysis, this guy scales one over Q squared well, that's a problem because this would be super classical. And that makes no sense. So what's going on? Well, um, this does not contribute to the potential because if you remember when we match, we have to calculate the full theory diagram, but then we need to subtract the effective theory diagram that, that shows up at one loop, right? So the full theory, the coefficient V is full minus effective. Now, before we could ignore the effective at tree level, but at one loop, we can't ignore it anymore and we have to subtract it. And this exactly cancels. So this also scales is super classical 
and cancels the super classical piece here. All right, so you get a, a sensible result. So in general, if you were doing um, unit, unitary methods, then if you have a diagram like this, then you know that that piece will, um, will cancel the matching and so it can be ignored. So the advantage of this is that you can, um, you can ignore a lot of some of the topologies in um, once you do generalized unitarity. So if you're using, um, you know, you build up, if you're using amplitudes as you're learning, you build up these tree level pieces and you sew them together using generalized unitarity, but some of them you don't need to consider. Um, and the advantage, one of the advantages of using this methodology, um, in addition to the fact that, of course, you don't have to draw Feynman diagrams. And so you, you know, at, 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 at uh, 4 p.m., if you draw Feynman diagrams, or something like 500 diagrams. Although there are tricks you can use to reduce it to a few hundred. Uh, but in amplitudes, of course, you just have a few topologies that you need to worry about. Well, not a few. At 4 p.m., you get more. Um, but another advantage of using the amplitude method is that you can uh, calculate fully relativistically. So um, you can keep all the V corrections, all of them. And this seems like it's a little bit too good to be true because uh, you think you would solve the problem exactly, but you're not because when you're doing the loop expansion, that's a G expansion. So if you keep up to order G to the N and all orders in V, then um, you haven't done anything systematic in the post Newtonian expansion because <clears throat> if you calculated G to the N plus one, that would be down by V squared. And um, these pieces are left uncalculated. So you've calculated all orders in V, but you've dropped terms of the same order that you've calculated. So when you calculate all orders in V, but fixed, uh, Uh, but fixed um, in G, that's called the PM expansion for post Minkowskian, and it's not systematic for the binaries. Because even though you've kept all orders in V, you dropped higher order terms in G, some of which are the same order of terms that you kept. So, um, so uh, then why would you bother calculating in the PM expansion? Uh, and the answer is um, because you're, you're picking up some pieces of the higher orders in V. So you can calculate a whole bunch of the V corrections to the next order in the PN expansion. You just need to calculate the pieces you now will be missing will be higher order in G, but lower order in V. So you'll still need to calculate the higher loops to do things systematically. Um, but nonetheless, the, the people at LIGO like to have the PM result as sort of a guess as to what happens at higher order in V. So when you start to go try to make a prediction for the signal in the region where V starts to get large, you might hope that the PM expansion uh, captures most of the physics, of course, it can't, doesn't get it exactly, it's just a rough guess. Um, uh, and the, but the, I know for a fact that the LIGO people do use um, um, do use uh, the PM results. Um, I should say there's also ways of getting the PM results within the effective field theory uh, without using amplitudes as well. And they, the, there are two groups which are calculating one group with amplitudes or multiple groups with amplitudes and one group with just uh, using the effective theory um, and they seem to be getting the same results. Um, now, I should say, um, you know, why 
<coughs> these calculations are hard. So why, um, and then I'll stop. I, really, I apologize for going over a little bit over. Um, why would you wanna bother? Is it really that important that we calculate higher order uh, corrections? It, uh, in other words, well, certainly at the LHC, we wanna do that so we can look for new physics, but that's exactly, exactly why we wanna do it for gravitational waves. So in particular, um, if you power count the love numbers, then they show up at 5 p.n. So in order to extract the love numbers from the data, you need to have 5 p.n. accuracy. As I said, right now we're at 4 p.n. accuracy. So there's still work to be done to get to 5 p.n. Uh, we're not actually, I take it back, we're not actually at 4 p.n. accuracy right now. We're 4 p.n. in the potentials but not 4 p.n. in radiation. So there's still a lot of work to be done in radiation before we reach 4 p.n. And then to get to 5 p.n. is the next major step that uh, people are looking at, uh, which could take a while and some concerted effort by um, the community. So um, that's why I believe uh, calculating these higher order corrections are important. Okay, so um, that's a good place to stop. Okay, I, I think we can cut this out then. So um, we can stop recording now.